Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Matthew going verse by verse, as always, and we come today to Matthew 18. And we left off in verse 27. I'm going to begin reading in verse 23 because that's when this section begins. So open your Bible to Matthew 18, and we will begin in just a minute after I remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Study the entire Bible with me, verse by verse, from Genesis through Revelation, four series. Stay uh, Going back 34 plus years now, um, they're all archived for you. That's right, three complete series, almost four, for you archived at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. So you click on the series, the book of the Bible, the section, the chapter, click and listen. That's all you have to do. Bring your Bible and a hunger for God's Word to the BibleVerseByVerse.com. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, as I said, we're going to begin today in Matthew 18, verse 23. We covered these first four verses last time, but that's okay. Jesus said, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king who would take account of his servants. His servants, in this case, refer to his governors. Kingdoms had governors that ruled over smaller sections of the kingdom. And one of the jobs of the governor was to collect taxes in his area and then pass it on to the king. So this king is going to audit the books to make sure that everybody has been collecting their taxes correctly. 24. And when he began to reckon, one was brought unto him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, I mentioned last time that 10,000 talents, 10,000 talents is a lot of money like a billion dollars worth of money in today's finances. So this king had not been, or this uh, governor had not been collecting taxes for a long time. Or he's been collecting it and pocketing it or spending it or something, but he doesn't have it. He hasn't given it to the king. He is a billion dollars in debt. That's 10,000 talents. And just so you know how much 10,000 talents was back in those days, It took an average worker, an average worker, average wage, 20 years to make one talent. 20 years of working to make one talent. He owed 10,000 talents, which means he would have to work 200,000 years and give every cent to the king to pay off this debt. And the point is, he owed a debt that he couldn't possibly ever pay. 25. But for as much as he had nothing with which to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So he is sold, his wife is sold. Let's say they had six children. So that's eight people altogether. You know what the top price was for a servant? And this is the top price, one talent. That was top price. So if he was lucky, he would have gotten eight talents. Doesn't even make a tiny little dent in the 10,000 talents that he owed. So he has nothing, no hope, nothing. Verse 25. Actually, verse 26, the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee off. Well, that's all he could do. The Bible says here in verse 25, for as much as he had nothing with which to pay, he recognized it. It says that the man could not pay. And the same thing could be said about us everyone, and our sin debt to God. The man had this huge financial debt, 
And that was a picture of our sin debt. That's what this story that Jesus is telling is all about. No human being has the means to pay off their sin debt. We cannot earn forgiveness because the Bible says all of our righteousness is but filthy rag. So we have no way that we can pay off our sin debt and we have no way to work it off because our righteousness is as filthy rags according to God Almighty himself. Go to the grocery store and fill your cart and try paying for it with filthy rags. See how far you get. Go down to the car dealer and tell him you want a brand new 2021 vehicle and say, here, I've got this box full of filthy rags. That should cover it. See how far you get. You can't buy groceries. You can't buy a car with filthy rags. And you certainly cannot pay off your sin debt to God with your filthy rags, good works. We can't pay our sins. We're in way over, the, over our heads, just like this governor could not pay his debt because we don't have what it takes any more than he did. 26, the servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. The governor had done wrong, but at least he had the character and the humility to admit it. You say, well, yeah, but he was caught. Well, a lot of people get caught in sin today and they blame their mother or society or whatever. Or they rename sin to, uh, to be dysfunction or behavior disorder. But they certainly, many, many people will not call it sin and many preachers will not make them call it sin because they don't have the guts to say what it really is. This guy admitted that he was wrong. He didn't make up excuses. He didn't blame someone else. He took full responsibility, and he did the only thing he could do. He asked for mercy. And every single human being, every single human being is a sinner in the same situation with God that this man was in with the king. Unfortunately for many, they do not follow this man's example because they make up excuses for their sins or they blame someone else for the bad things that they have done or they just rename it, redefine it to be something else. They do their very best to avoid guilt. But it doesn't work. God, God isn't buying it. The only hope sinners have is to humble themselves, admit that they have sinned, and ask God for mercy through Jesus Christ, like this governor did. And that, my friends, is Jesus' point of this story so far. I hope you got that. 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. What an amazing show of mercy this was. This king graciously forgave the governor his entire debt. And he did it because he had compassion. He did it because he was merciful to the one who asked for mercy. And we are very fortunate indeed that God works the same way. Every time a sinner truly humbles themselves before him, and asks for mercy through Jesus Christ. God grants that forgiveness and mercy. He completely forgets their entire sin debt, just like this king forgave this governor's financial debt. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us. But then, wait till you see verse 28. Verse 28. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him an hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. This man, who had been forgiven his billion-dollar debt, went out and found a fellow servant 
who owed him about three months' wages, which, of course, is a lot of money, but not nearly the amount that he had owed the king. And he grabbed his fellow servant by the throat and demanded payment. Pay me what you owe. 29. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. The words of this fellow servant were the exact same words that he had spoken to the king. Exactly. He should have immediately thought about his words to the king and how the king had been so gracious to him. And the same is true for us Christians. Every single time someone asks us for forgiveness or tells us that they are sorry, we should remember all the times that we have gone to God and asked for forgiveness ourselves. We should remember all the times that God has forgiven us. Well, did this man remember the mercy that he had received? Look at 30. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. He would not. He would not forgive. The governor, who had been forgiven over a billion dollars, refused to forgive a debt of three months' wages, even though that man had humbled himself just as he had humbled himself before the king. Of course, you know, the governor had been willing to accept forgiveness when he needed it, but he wasn't willing to grant forgiveness to someone else who needed it from him. You say, that's outrageous. How can anyone who has been forgiven so much be so unmerciful toward others? Good question. And the same question applies to Christians today. How could a Christian who has been forgiven so much by God ever refuse to forgive a fellow Christian who has sinned against them and confessed it and apologized? Well, I don't know, but it sure does happen. And that's our Lord's point. And he's just getting started. 31, so when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. So the man's fellow, fellow governors understood what a terrible thing the forgiven governor had done. They heard of it. They couldn't believe it. So they went and they told the king all about it. 32, then his Lord after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou besoughtest me. The king called this governor who refused to forgive wicked. Wicked. And it is wicked in the eyes of God when we refuse to forgive someone who has confessed their sin against us and apologized for what they have done. It is wicked. You think that other person is so bad and that's why you can't forgive them? Well, if they confess and they repent and they apologize and you don't forgive them, you're at least as wicked as they are in the eyes of God. 33. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? The governor had been shown mercy and had been forgiven, but he refused to show mercy, and that is why the king called him wicked. It is a wicked thing, as I said, in the eyes of God, for a Christian who has been forgiven so much to hold a grudge against someone who has done something wrong to them and confessed 
and ask for forgiveness. It is a wicked thing in the sight of God for a Christian to be bitter and unforgiving towards someone who has sinned against them if they have confessed their sins. Who do Christians who refuse to forgive think they are? Who do they think they are? Do they, and do they think they're better than God? Evidently. Do they think they're more important than God? I guess. Do they actually think that offenses against God can be forgiven? Offenses against a holy, righteous, pure God can be forgiven. But sins against them are so serious, you know, that they could never be forgiven. That is great wickedness. 34. And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the inquisitors till he should pay all that was due unto him. And you know how long that took? Forever and ever and ever. I want you to see something here. The governor had his forgiveness reversed, and he was forced to pay for his sin. I've got a suggestion for you. Do not go to your grave with unforgiveness on your soul. If you are a Christian, do not go to your grave with unforgiveness on your soul. I don't know exactly what awaits someone who refuses to forgive, but I don't, I don't have to know exactly what it is because I know for sure that it is not good. 34 and 35. And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the inquisitors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother his trespasses. The man was sent to the torture chamber to pay for his sin of unforgiveness. And then, and then, Jesus says to Christians, the same thing will happen to you. And like I said in the previous verse, I don't have to know all the details about what that means, but I do know that it is bad. And I do know that bitterness and the sin of unforgiveness are indications that one is not right with God through Jesus Christ and is therefore in danger of eternal hell fire. Don't go to your grave with unforgiveness on your soul. Because the lesson of this parable is your unforgiveness will be, or your forgiveness will be reversed if you don't forgive others. Chapter 19, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the border of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Jesus concluded his ministry up north in Galilee and as a result heads south toward Jerusalem. Verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, testing him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? The Pharisees didn't like Jesus because they didn't like how he was so popular. They had nothing against him regarding the Word of God. They didn't like him because he was so popular. Consequently, they figured that if they could get him to comment on divorce, which was a very touchy subject, very divisive issue in that day, then he would probably lose support of at least some of his followers, maybe half. So that's why they want him to comment on divorce. So again, let's read the question and then look at verses 4 and 5. The Pharisees also came unto him, testing him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh? States can legalize same-sex marriages today if they want to. They can pass a law, 
and say that it is legal to do that. But they're just playing make-believe. It's not real. It's not marriage. You can call it what you want, state of Wisconsin. You can call it what you want, state of California. You can call, call it whatever you want, Mr. Judge, Mr. Politician who passed the law. You can call it anything you want. But marriage was instituted by God. It is not the invention of man. It is not the invention of the state. Marriage can only be between a man and a woman. God has said it. God does not recognize any other arrangement as being mar marriage. Same-sex marriages are just ongoing sins of fornication. Six. Wherefore, they are no more two but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God's plan for marriage has not changed. His plan is one woman, one man, until death do them part. That was his answer. Well, they got a follow-up question, verse 7. They say unto him, why, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? In Deuteronomy chapter 4, God really did allow for a divorce. It had to be done through legal means, but he did allow for divorce. 8. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Divorce was not what God had in mind for marriage. He allowed it because sometimes sin causes problems in marriage to the point where divorce becomes the lesser of two evils. But it's never a good thing. The law God gave permitting divorce was meant to restrain hasty divorce by demanding sufficient cause and legal formalities. It was never intended, it was never intended to promote divorce. 9. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her who is put away, doth commit adultery. According to Jesus, two people who have been joined together by God, in other words, a divinely recognized marriage can only get a divorce when there has been unfaithfulness. Otherwise, if there is remarriage, the parties are guilty of adultery. And Jesus reiterates God's plans for marriage, God's plan for marriage, as it was in the beginning. In other words, you ask me my opinion on marriage and divorce, I've given you God's mind on the issue. What does the Word of God say? As usual, Jesus pointed people to what the Word of God says on whatever issue was at hand. And he just did it on divorce. On divorce. 10. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. The disciples say, well, if a person can't get out of their marriage any time they want to, then I guess it's better not to get married at all. Well, I don't know about that, but it sure is a good idea not to be hasty in marriage. Verse 11, But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, except they to whom it is given. Marriage isn't for everyone, but neither is being single. And that's what Jesus is saying. 12. For there are some eunuchs who were so born from their mother's womb. Let's stop there for a second. In other words, some have been born without the ability to reproduce or have a normal physical relationship with the opposite sex. They stay single without any problem. But he goes on to say, And there are, there are some eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. Back in those days in some cultures, if a king wanted someone to be in charge of his harem, he would find a man and have him castrated. They, would get, they, would get, they wouldn't get married either. They were made eunuchs by the king. Last part of verse 12. And there are, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. This type of eunuch, well, let's continue to read him, for the kingdom of heaven's sake, he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So this third type of eunuch could be married, 
There isn't anything holding them back physically. However, they choose to say, stay single so that they can serve God with fewer distractions. And Jesus goes on to say, he that is able to receive it, let him receive it, acknowledging that not all can receive it. If a Christian is walking with God and they are not married, if a Christian is walking with God and they are not married, it is because God does not want them to be married. At least right now, he doesn't. Right this second, while they are single, he obviously doesn't want them to be married or they would have been married. Let me say it again. If a Christian is walking with the Lord and they're not married, it is because God doesn't want them to be married, at least right now. Maybe next week, God will bring the right person across their path. Maybe tomorrow, God will bring the right person across their path. The wise thing for a Christian to do is to not be concerned about it. Just walk with God. That's where your concern should be. That's where my concern needs to be. Walk with God and he will work things out the way he wants them to be. If a Christian is married, fine. If they are single, fine. God has called some to be single and some to be married. You walk with the Lord, and if he brings the right person across your path and you want to get married, get married. It's not that complicated. Verse 13. Then were brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray, but the disciples rebuked them. People were bringing their children to Jesus for his blessing. Good idea. Good idea for people to bring their children to Jesus today. And people can do that today by teaching them to pray, telling them Bible stories, especially stories about Jesus. Parents can bring children to Christ today by living for Christ themselves and talking about him in the midst of their daily routine. If parents, be, if parents let Jesus be a part of their daily life, then that will be a very natural way to bring Jesus and their children together. 14. But Jesus said, Permit little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid hands, he laid his hands on them and departed from there. Concerning Jesus, or I should say concerning children, Jesus said, Of such is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. There is no pretense with little children. They are honest and trusting and humble. They need help. And they know they need help. Jesus said, we must become like a child to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Which means the only way anyone can be saved is by understanding that they need help. And by coming to Christ for that help. A child is humble, and sinners must humble themselves. A child knows they need help, and sinners must come to God acknowledging that they need help. A child is humble, needs help, they know it, and so they come to their parents and ask for it. And sinners must humble themselves, repent, and ask Christ to save them acknowledging that they don't have what it takes. That's how it's done, ladies and gentlemen. There is no other way. We covered a lot of stuff today, didn't we? And if you want to study with me further, you can go to the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com and study the whole Bible with me at your pace, at your convenience, by choosing, clicking, and listening. And please remember, Scripture Verse by Verse for 34 years has never been underwritten by a large church or denomination. It's been a faith ministry. So if you want to be a part of this ministry and help me get out God's word, pray for me, pray for the word of God. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at the thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Until next time, this is Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.